Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started and folks will trickle in as as we do some of these introductions. So thanks to everyone for joining tonight. I'm Alec Karakatsanis, founder and executive director of Civil Rights Corps and author of Usual Cruelty, which is published by the New Press. I want to thank everyone at the New Press, uh, particularly Jay and, and Brian and Emily and Diane and all those who've worked on the book and for helping us put this together, uh, put the, this event together tonight. Also thanks to the three amazing scholars and friends of mine who have joined us tonight, Jamelia Morgan, Amna Akbar, and Sean Hopwood. Um, we're expecting a lot of folks from around the country and I'm not very good at, at Zoom. So I please bear with me if there's any technical difficulties, um, we'll hopefully get it squared away. Uh, and thanks to all those of you uh, joining us live on YouTube as well as Zoom. We have a Q&A box open and our moderators from the new press will be monitoring that for questions. And hopefully after we have a little bit of a discussion among the panelists, we can get to some of your questions. I wanna briefly highlight before we start something called the Unusual Fund. The Unusual Fund is a special initiative through the New Press, which will pay for free copies of my book, Usual Cruelty, uh, for any student in any class, high school, college, or law school around the country, where a teacher assigns any portion of the book. Um, we're putting a link to that Unusual Fund into the chat box now. Um, so uh, for every student that gets a free copy of the book, um, the New Press is also sending a free copy to someone in prison. Um, and we've already gotten wonderful uh, reports of uh, prison book clubs and think tanks in prisons all over the country reading the book um, and engaging with, with the ideas, as well as uh, high school, college, and, and law professors sending me notes about the discussions that the Unusual Fund has made possible in their classrooms around the country. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, you can email Jay Gupta at the New Press. It's jgupta at thenewpress.com, and Jay will put his email address also in the, the chat box. You're also welcome to donate the Unusual Fund, which can support um, free books for students and, and people in prison. So um, I want to talk a little bit um, just very, very briefly about, about the book and about our organization's work. Um, the book is called Usual Cruelty, the Complicity of Lawyers in the Criminal Injustice System. Um, it has been called by my grandmother the single greatest book ever written by one of her grandchildren on the topic of the criminal punishment bureaucracy, uh, which is a term my grandmother coined. Uh, and so that book is really an effort um, in, in three relatively short essays to um, offer some thoughts about um, what the criminal punishment bureaucracy is and, and how we might be able to confront it as people who work inside of it, as people who who live in a society uh, often controlled and determined by its cruelty, um, and, and as just human beings um, who have friends and family and loved ones and, and, and people important to us who are, are put into that assembly line bureaucracy every single day. The first essay is called The Punishment Bureaucracy, and it's really an attempt um, to answer a few questions, like um, how does our society choose what to define as a crime, right? Um, for, for a long time in our country's history, um, the possession of certain plants has been a crime, as long as those plants are on a list of plants the government says you can't possess. Um, at some point in our history, the government decided to make it a crime um, to gamble or wager over dice in the streets, at least if you're poor, but not to be a crime to wager over the fate of international currencies or the global supply of wheat, even though wagering over the global supply of wheat has led to the starvation of tens of millions of human beings. Again, not a crime. How do we make those decisions? What interests are reflected in our society's decisions about whether to make it a crime to say, join a union or a crime to try to stop people from joining a union or um, make it a crime to possess a firearm or a crime to try to stop someone from possessing a firearm. These are all um, political choices that reflect distributions of power, that reflect a history of white supremacy, that, that reflect the interests of people who own things in our society. For example, should it be a crime for a person who doesn't have any food to take food from a grocery store? These are some of the most central policy questions of our, of our world. And to just lump them in to the criminal justice system really denies um, the, the, the very important racial and economic decisions that people in power are making when they decide whether something's a crime. I also decide, uh, decided to talk a little bit about in that, that first essay, among the things that are criminal, where do we look for those crimes? Who are we prosecuting for them? Where are we investigating? What neighborhoods? When are we doing it, right? There are many, many things that are criminalized in our society, but, but that are essentially decriminalized depending on who you are, how much money you have, and where you live. Um, for example, where I went to college, uh, use of illegal drugs and underage drinking was rampant. 
um, on Yale's campus. And right down the street in, in New Haven, um, uh, people who looked different, who didn't have uh, the financial resources that many of the people who attended school at Yale had, were routinely brutalized um, and arrested and caged and separated from their families and put into dangerous, grotesque torture chambers like the New Haven jail system and the, the Connecticut Department of Corrections for doing the exact same things that people on Yale's campus were routinely allowed to do with no, no consequences. Um, I then sort of talk about, if, given um, what it, the, the sort of the role that our criminal punishment bureaucracy plays in, in distributive choices in our society about who has wealth and who has power and what, how we treat different segments of our population, I then have a discussion about why I think most of what you hear about in the criminal justice reform discourse is completely inadequate um, at best. At worst, it's propaganda designed to get you to think that slight tweaks are being made to the criminal punishment system that are just in effect preserving the architecture of that bureaucracy of, of racial injustice and, and economic exploitation that has really been the history of the criminal punishment system for a couple hundred years. The next essay, The Human Lawyer, I make an attempt to, to talk uh, about the law school experience and the student experience more generally, and how to think uh, about what you might do with your career um, when you're confronted with a system that is so horribly unjust. How do you come together with other people? How do you think about cultivating your own mind in a system that is designed to make all of the injustices of the system become normal? It's designed to desensitize you to the incredible brutality of the punishment bureaucracy. As a student, as a young lawyer, how do you confront that? How do you fortify your mind against the society that's constantly telling you that what's happening is normal? Um, and then the final essay, Policing um, Mass Imprisonment and the Failure of American Lawyers, is really an attempt to, to confront the intellectual and moral failures of the legal profession as a whole. Um, why have we as lawyers um, tolerated the creation of a system that is so horribly unjust and so far removed from any of the the lofty ideals that are carved on our marble monuments and written in our constitutional scroll. So uh, with that, I'm gonna introduce our other panelists um, for what hopes to be a, a lively discussion about that book and about abolition and about you know, the, the role of all of us uh, who live in our society to fight against it. So um, maybe we can start with Jamelia. Thank you, Alec. Um, I first also want to extend my thanks to the uh, coordinators of this wonderful event, um, Jay in particular, and Alec to thank you personally. I think um, over the years, your work has really been influential in my own thinking. And so I'm really excited to be on a panel with you, Sean, on the as well uh, to talk more about this issue. So I'll talk a little bit about my work and then pass it off uh, to Amna. So I um, am a law professor. Before that, I worked at the Abolitionist Law Center uh, using the tools of law to try to resist and push back against the punishment bureaucracy that uh, Alec referenced uh, with a particular focus on um, incarcerated people with disabilities and the use of solitary confinement to both control, segregate, and contain individuals with with, uh, in particular psych disabilities, cognitive disabilities, intellectual disabilities uh, in conditions that the uh, United Nations has uh, said amounts to torture. And so using the law, um, we were able as um, uh, litigators to um, end the conditions amounting to solitary confinement for individuals sentenced to death uh, in, a, in a recent case. And I also uh, used that prior experience as an entry point into thinking about um, how to change the operating logics uh, that would lead to a system whereby we use carceral systems to respond to disability, to respond to non-normativity, et cetera. And so my research now really just looks at race, disability, gender, and the carceral state, um, ranging really from the policing of quality, so-called quality of life offenses, uh, disorderly conduct, loitering, uh, pretty much appearing in public uh, in a way that is offensive to capitalist interests, in a way that uh, is perceived as a threat to, to property owners, in a way um, that is just perceived as disorderly to uh, the mainstream public. Um, so I'm, I'm looking in particular at, again, disability and race in the policing context, and then also um, as a continuation of my litigation in the uh, carceral spaces, both jail and prisons. Um, I'll pass it off to you, Amna. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here, and I'm so grateful for the space and for Alex's work um, and to be on a panel with Jamelia and Sean, and my thanks to the New Press as well. Um, so I'll be super brief. I mean, I was a lawyer before I went to the academy. I did a whole range of things very briefly. I worked at legal services. I did impact litigation, 
community lawyering and to movement lawyering. Um, and even though in some ways I never was in a traditional kind of public defender role, it was kind of because I was like moving through these different worlds that I started to see how policing and prison shape every aspect of life in ways that's particularly br brutal for poor people uh, of color in the United States. Um, when I went into the academy, um, I started looking at policing and how policing was um, kind of morphed, shifted, and intensified um, on Muslim communities after 9-11 and started to um, develop kind of a deeper understanding of the, of the relationship between policing, racialization, and inequality. Um, and then in 2014, you know, I'd always, I was, grew up in a family that went to protests and grew up kind of participating in social movements of various sorts. But 2014, when Darren Wilson killed Michael Brown and there were solidarity protests all over the country, um, I kind of stepped into the world of Black Lives Matter and the movement for Black Lives and was really, really moved by um, how at this one particular protest that was like one mile away from where I teach, that there were conversations about a lot of the same issues that we talked about one mile down the street at the law school, but the account of those problems, whether it was police violence or economic inequality, were radically different than the account that was often taught in the law school that I work at, um, and that the solutions kind of being thought of and developed in movement spaces and at protests were also so radically different. And so I became super invested invest invested and captivated in the kind of different stories we can tell about the world that we live in and the different ways we can think about the world we're fighting for and then the way that strategy you know the strategies from to get from here to there um, and so a lot of what i write about now is about uh, social movement epistemes and also their kind of uh, strategies tactics and visions for fighting for a different world and try to put that in relation to uh, what lawyers and um, more liberal kind of ways of thinking um, look like i'll pass it to sean well, I'm also thankful to be on this panel with Jamelia and Amna and Alec, um, my neighbor. And uh, Alec and I have been talking about some of the things in his book for several years now. And, um, you know, I work, I'm a law professor at Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, I'll give my standard intro just because this is what I like to do. I'm an associate professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center, and I committed a violent crime, but I am not a violent criminal. And I always start my introduction out that way, regardless of whether I'm standing in the Senate, before the president, in a rotary club, in a church, what have you, just because I want people to realize that those that commit crime is not a character trait. It's not a state. It is something that often happens um, not because of someone's bad character, although that may have not been the case in my particular case, um, but that, you know, people have the capacity to change. And, and that's what I work on is, is the change and second chances specifically. I do a lot of criminal justice reform, uh, mostly on the federal side, uh, everything from going up and having meetings up um, with members of Congress. Uh, I do a lot of work with federal judges uh, reentry courts, um, and I still do a fair amount of litigation in federal district and circuit courts. Um, you know, wh why, why is criminal justice reform important? Well, it's important on a structural level, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight, but I'm continually reminded with clients of mine how important it is to just win individual cases and reunite families and get people out of what I think is one of the most awful places in the world, which is a prison. Um, which is generally not the place for personal growth. And generally people come out worse off, not better. And, and my view is, is we need to drastically change that. But in the meantime, I work on little individual pieces where I can get change, like the First Step Act and, and litigating individual cases until we're ready to have more meaningful discussions about structural reform. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I think we're just going to open up to have a little bit of a conversation now about the ideas in the book and some of the, the, the surrounding ideas about abolition. Um, maybe, uh, Jamelia, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I had a few comments and thoughts. I wanted to think a little bit 
um, about the law school experience and legal education and thinking in many ways of, about how the book speaks to, and you noted Alec, one of the chapters in particular talks about the experience of being a law student and learning legal doctrine. I think one of the things to keep in mind, um, uh, particularly to the broader question of sort of how do we get to a, a point where lawyers, despite their best intentions, are complicit in what you term the usual cruelty. I think we have to really start earlier in, in the process, in the process of learning the law and learning uh, what it means to engage with doctrine and, and the role of legal institutions in producing uh, justice. And so one thing to think about, um, and I guess I can speak from my own experience, is coming into law school, uh, particularly the 1L experience, is sort of structured uh, around this idea that law is neutral, law is objective, law and justice tend to align more often than not. And that kind of to, again, a basic premise of the book, that any injustices, whether it's racism, whether it's oppression, uh, systematic exclusion are aberrational, not like a foundational feature of a particular system. And so I think one of the first things to think about is and I think about this in, in my role as an instructor, like in what ways do we cultivate that understanding of law? In what ways do we encourage our law students to push back against the dominant paradigms of law as objective, law as neutral, law as apolitical, for instance? And so I think that what it really calls for is an engagement with uh, different ways of knowing within the legal classroom, uh, the law school classroom. And um, for me, uh, quite fortuitously, before I started law school, I was able to be mentored by um, critical race theorists. And so I, I started my law school experience already in oppositional stance because I was familiar with the work of folk like Kimberly Crenshaw and Devin Carbato and Mari Matsuda. And so I'm sitting in my constitutional law class, I'm sitting in my criminal law class wanting to have conversations about the racial injustices of the criminal legal system. I also started law school uh, th at the same time that Michelle Alexander uh, published the new Jim Crow, which you know, ten years later feels, you know, um, that moment feels important. I mean, I, my politics have since uh, evolved in in many directions uh, or past sort of the kind of liberal reform model that Alexander puts forth. But it was very transformative to at least sit in a criminal law class and want to talk about race and and uh, attempt to have that conversation, but then be actively shut down by my law professor uh, in particular uh, when the conversation was heading in, in that direction. And so I think we have to think uh, broadly about, you know, what are the values that I think we're instilling, or at least the project of legal, legal education is about instilling within our uh, within law students. And, and for those of us law professors that want to create um, more conversation um, or, or want to engage with the variety of political um, uh, ways in which law is produced and, and the ways in which law produces harm as a result, um, inviting in conversations with critical race theorists, inviting in conversations uh, with abolitionists, I think is one way to do this. And, that, and this is coming from someone that does teach uh, criminal law. So um, I guess I wanted to start the conversation there and again, maybe push us to think about the role of lawyers as your book does, Alec, um, but also sort of the institution of law itself and how it propagates these ideas that um, ignore or or at least erase uh, some of the structural injustices that we know every day occur. Um, I think I'm next. Um, so I guess I wanted to step back a little bit and um, just think about the moment that we're in, which is raising some fundamental questions about the shape of the state and why it looks the way that it is and why police and prisons are at the center of it. Um, because I think that kind of helps us to think about what is it precisely that lawyers and the legal academy are complicit in and what, you know, what, how, in what other directions might we be moving. So as we all know, this is a moment of crisis where there's widespread revolt of all sorts against the norms and the rules and the laws of our society. We have tens of millions of people on unemployment. We have tens of millions of people facing possible an ev uh, eviction and houselessness this fall. We have COVID spreading through not just our communities generally, but the prison, our loved ones who are incarcerated um, and killing many people that way. We have deadly police violence on display with obvious links in the last few days to white nationalism, right? So the Kenosha police killed Jacob, or sorry, shot Jacob Blake. 
a couple of days ago. And last night, a 13 year old man with right, connected to a right wing militia killed two people and injured a third. And in this crisis and in the revolts against the crisis, you see that law and legal institutions are at the center. Incarceration, policing, deportation, and eviction. These are all legal processes that lawyers participate in at every level, whether it's constructing, uh, constructing the policy, enforcing the laws, um, you know, defending um, these institutions in court. And even in the revolt and the uprising and the social movements, law is also at the center. Law is what protesters are kind of rebelling against. Um, it's the response by the police um, and mayors and city councils um, you are kind of mobilizing the force of the law and legal discourse, both to repress protest and to co-opt radical movement energy around abolitionist demands and the call to defund, right? And so these moments um, are important. They denaturalize things as they are. They raise questions about why things are the way that they are and allow us to have broader, more expansive, imaginative conversations and push harder towards the visions of the world that we want to build, right? Because denaturalization or disruption, right? This, this kind of aspect of what's going on, that's really important, but it's also not the same as change, right? So we have to figure out in some ways to the extent that for those of us who are committed to substantive equality, to transformative change, how do we maintain the state of disruption and at the same time build our capacity to build for, build for and fight for change, right? And so then that raises a bunch of questions about like what exactly is being denaturalized right now, right? Partly it's policing and its centrality to city life and municipal budgets. Um, it's the work of the state more broadly and its shape, right? So employment, healthcare, rent, the way that these are tied together, um, the way that the things that we need to survive are so hard to come by for most people. Um, is raising questions about why the state looks like the way it does and why our tax dollars go into policing and jails instead of housing and healthcare. And so it raises hard and important questions about how can we live together in ways that are sustainable for human flourishing um, and for forms of non-human life, right? And so in, in uh, kind of teaching pedagogical and academic discourse, a lot of times there's a lot of kind of like um, hand-wringing about neoliberalism and how hard it is to define. But in over the summer, we have seen neoliberalism on display in ways that everyone can understand, right? The shape of the state is that everything is invested in prisons and police to protect property rights, wealth, and wealth distribution in the way that it is and to kind of facilitate ongoing accumulation and not to share that wealth with everyday people and in support of people's needs, right? So neoliberalism is on display this summer in a way that you know, people are revolting um, against. And of course, we are in this moment of denaturalization, movement building, uprising. It's not, you know, it doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes out of uh, a long history of inequality, of state violence, of anti-black state violence. Um, it comes out of a long history of uprising, rebellion, and social movements. Um, and in this particular period of the last 10 years since Occupy, I think is really fertile for both these kind of moment, kind of um, these breaks have continued to kind of build on themselves, build momentum. You see movements and communities building their connections, building their analysis, their strategies, and their tactics, right? And so we have movements and uprisings, rebellions, labor strikes, um, and more. And so you have a growing sense that things as they are are not sustainable. And every time we have these kind of ruptures, right, we also continue, we, we are reminded that as people, we have a choice whether or not we consent or we rebel and we do something different. And that's a muscle, I mean, if you grew up in the 90s and 2000s like I did, you kind of can appreciate now that that's a muscle we sometimes collectively forget we have. And right now that muscle feels alive in really important ways. So the question for lawyers and law schools and for everyone really, is how do we build a new common sense and how do we fight for it to become reality? And as lawyers, law professors, law students, we have to think about what do we take responsibility for and how? And what are our roles in this moment as lawyers or scholars to kind of think about or move differently, facilitate different kinds of study and struggle. And so Alex's book, I think, is one really important model for that, as is the work of Civil Rights Corps, which I hope he'll talk about in a minute. Um, and everything that we're seeing on the streets happening over the summer uh, to this day, to this moment, it's also a really important place for lawyers and law students to be listening and learning about, um, you know, what the country looks like, because we all experience it in very different ways based on our social location.
Well, Alex's book brings up a couple big themes, and, and I think I'll start with something that Jamelia said about her law school experience. I too felt in law school that um, way too much time was spent on black letter law and just doctrine and not enough time on are these decisions right? Are these decisions wrong? How do these decisions impact people? Do they impact people equally? I, you know, I, I get into lots of discussions with my colleagues about um, how to teach these classes. I teach criminal procedure as a one L class and, and how I start my class is, you know, these ideas are not mutually exclusive. I usually start with, you know, let's discuss the facts and the law and the black letter law and the holdings. And, but then I leave space for, for students to discuss these broader issues because as I tell my students, if all I taught you was the black letter law, um, I, I feel like I would not be doing my job adequately. Um, and so, you know, leaving time open for professors, leaving time and, and kind of some open-ended space to have the hard discussions, which, you know, it's, it's difficult to do. Even in a law school setting, I find people don't like to discuss the very tough issues. But if we can't discuss them in a law school setting, I also feel like where can we discuss them? And so I, I try to encourage, you know, friends and, and other faculty to, to make time to have those discussions in the classroom because I think they can be transformative for students, particularly first year students, particularly students that, you know, come from struggle, people of color, low on the socioeconomic class, it gives them a chance to have their voice in class where they may not be as willing to open up about why this rationale for this holding is, is unpersuasive, but, th but they can bring some real world experience to it. And I think those have been some of the most fruitful discussions I've had in my classes since I've been a professor. One of the other things that Alec talked about and that's in the book that I just, I think about constantly is this decision on what is a crime how do we decide what is a crime? And if you look at the lines we draw, um, they're very inconsistent. I mean, if, if we were to tackle, I, I say this a lot, if we were to tackle the substance that is the most harmful in America, it would not be marijuana. It would probably not be cocaine or methamphetamine. It would be high fructose corn syrup is the biggest substance that is the biggest killer in America. But you will never see that, you know, turned into a crime in the same way you've seen, you know, decades of people locked up for a plant. And I was reminded about that just today, Alec. Um, I, I talked with a good friend of mine from prison who is struggling with his now adult children because he was incarcerated for 20 years and missed all four of his kids growing up and how much harm that has caused to that family. And do you know what he was incarcerated for 20 years for? Marijuana in the state of Illinois, which is now perfectly legal and which people are profiting off of daily. And it's just a reminder that, you know, we have to think bigger when, when it comes to determining things like overcriminalization. Where, wh why is it that we decided somewhere along the road that civil penalties aren't going to be enough and that everything has to be criminalized? We're now at the point where we have over 5,000 federal statutes. Um, federal criminal laws and 300,000 federal regulations that carry criminal penalties on top of a couple thousand criminal laws in each state. Uh, I, I, I say this and not glibly, that if anyone had to be in, investigated for a year by a federal prosecutor, few people in America would be able to survive because all of us have broken federal law at some point, sometimes unknowingly. And, and I think Alex's book does a good job of of raising these bigger issues about how it is that we came to a state where we thought everything needed to be punished and not just punished, but punished in the only way that it seems Americans understand, which is days, months, and years in prison. To pick up on, on some themes that you each raised um, and, and sort of highlight that what for me, what has become very salient about as I talk with more and more law students and as I've gone around and talked about the book. Alec, you're getting a bunch of feedback. I don't know if you also have the YouTube open or something. I don't know. It's like there's a whistle in the background as you talk. I'm so sorry. Is it still bad? It's not the worst, but yes, you can still hear it. This is a new computer. It's the first time I've ever used it. So 
I'm I'm so sorry. I don't know what to do. I, I think you could probably keep going unless the new press people have an idea. It's just like, it's a little like distracting, but it's not, it's okay. I'll try to hold it in a different- Maybe try muting your computer while you're talking. How, how do I mute my computer while I'm talking? Like mute your own computer. But then you won't be able to hear me. No, don't don't mute yourself. Mute just the volume on your own computer to see if it's just feedback from your computer being fed into your microphone that's causing the Okay, whistling. maybe that's, is that better? Sounds better. Okay, great. So apologies. Um, I've been thinking about something that I've never really talked about on one of these panels or discussions uh, before, but what I'm, what I'm fascinated by is, given what the three of you have just said, law schools um, really fail at, at, at educating people on, on what I think are the two most important aspects of, uh, that are required for um, a radical social movement. Number one is developing a systemic um, understanding and theory about why these things are happening. I've been thinking a lot today about the shooting of Jacob Blake. Um, and I've been seeing a lot of calls on, on social media and elsewhere to arrest and prosecute the cops who shot him and people boycotting things until the cops are arrested and prosecuted. And, and, and this sort of obviously mirrors something that we see a lot after these incidents. There's, there's incredibly righteous anger and, and a desire for some notion of justice. Um, and in our society, the way we think about justice is arresting and prosecuting someone who does harm. But a lot of these calls, in my opinion, lack a deeper structural analysis of what's going on with policing. What is the history of policing that evolved really from um, slave patrols and that evolved in most large urban jurisdictions from, um, from trying from the local corporate establishment and local governments trying to suppress labor strikes um, and understanding the, the current function of police, right? Um, only a very small percentage, 4% of all of police time in this country goes toward what's called violent crime, which is itself a concept that I think is socially constructed, but which is the concept that police use to justify their own existence. So the first thing that we're not taught in law school and the first requirement, I think, for developing a radical social movement against the inequality and injustice in our society that is reflected by police departments is developing an understanding of why these systems look the way that they look. Why is it the case that black people are caged and arrested at 19 times the rate of white people in Washington DC where I live? Why is it that the US cages black people at six times the rate of South Africa at the height of apartheid? It's not individual bad apple cops. Um, it's not the, the, the theory that we need to understand that, right? Why is it that 90% of all people charged with crimes are poor in this country, right? Why is it that, that what's determined a crime and where we look for crimes has to do with who has access to wealth? Um, we need to develop um, a systemic understanding of why that is. Law schools don't offer that, right? Um, we teach the law as it is, and we don't teach people to understand the law as a structure of power. The second thing that law schools don't teach is how do we organize together and develop the relationships and connections that it's gonna take to challenge those powerful systems, right? Um, so when, when law schools don't teach how power works and don't teach how we can band together to fight that, those systems of power, they can't produce movement lawyers. They can't produce lawyers who understand what it takes to not only win a case here or there, um, working within the system, but to work with people that are building power outside that system and to use the law as a small piece of a broader movement to build power in communities to challenge the powerful interests that created those laws. Because if we just win a few cases and seek reforms within the system without changing the underlying balance of power, the same people who created all of these systems of oppression for the last 200 years, right? Since we've had uh, a United States of America, um, will be the same people who are gonna decide what replaces those systems. And the same mechanisms of oppression will exist with a different label. And so when I go around and I talk to law students now, I'm really interested in helping them figure out the answers to those two questions. 
Number one, how do you develop a, a real understanding of what's going on? How do you educate yourself? How do you most importantly fortify your mind against the relentless propaganda of our society, which is constantly telling you that things are as they should be, right? The New York Times is telling you that there's a surge in shootings, that this is what you should care about, right? Um, all these academics out there are writing about how we shouldn't dismantle and defund police departments. We need to give them more resources, more body cameras to watch them oppressing people in the same neighborhoods, more bias training, because the real problem is cops just don't understand that they're biased. And if we just gave them a little bit more money for training, these solutions fundamentally misunderstand the problem. And so what I tell law students is surround yourself with people who are critical thinkers with people who are going to push you and hold you accountable and who don't take as given what they're told of our society. Surround yourself with poets and artists and musicians and people who sort of naturally tend to, to push back against the, the sort of um, the ways that we're taught we have to do things because great art and great poetry and great literature are always about subverting the convention. And if you expose yourself to that, to art and music and poetry that is being done in service of a radical social movement that is being done by people who've been directly impacted by the criminal punishment system, you will in ways that you can't even really appreciate, open your mind up to what Amna and Amelia and, and Sean were talking about different ways of knowing, right? Um, and the third thing is, um, where do you get your information about the world? Are you getting your information about our society from the institutions that have an interest in preserving our current society from the New York Times and the Washington Post? And MSNBC and Fox News and CNN? Is that where you're getting your information about what's going on in the world? Because those outlets have deliberate incentives to, to cover some stories and not cover stories at all. A lot of people think that bias in the media comes from what they say about topics. That's not really true. I mean, it is true, but it, it's only telling a very small portion of the story. Most of the bias comes from what those, what those entities tell you is important, what they choose to cover and what they don't cover. The fact that they cover when there is 11 more shootings in New York City this year than last year and call that a surge, right? Versus not doing a story every single night on the millions of children that are dying every single year because they don't have access to enough food to have nutritious diets, right? Um, the tens of thousands of New Yorkers who die every single year because of violations of local pollution laws, these are because of lack of access to health care. Imagine if there was a front page story every day saying another 403 people died in New York City today because of preventable air pollution, water pollution, and lack of access to health care. These are the structural stories that our media is ignoring. And in law school, the focus on legal doctrine um, is really um, disempowering students from developing that kind of structural analysis. Um, and then just because Amna mentioned it, I'll just say one quick thing about our work, because I think it gets to the second piece of what I was talking about, which is given that you've developed an understanding of how these systems work, how might you be able to develop an effective legal career or activism career to try to dismantle them? And, and I think we don't do this perfectly well and in, in much from even most of our work at this point, but all of our work, every time we decide about getting into a legal case, whether it's our work bringing systemic lawsuits to challenge the cash bail system or systemic lawsuits to challenge how there are 11 million people in this country who've been deprived of their driver's license because they owe debts. These are people who now can't go to work, can't go to the hospital, can't take their kids to school, can't even take their kids to a playground because they don't have a car, right? Um, challenging fines and fees, right? Challenging prosecutorial misconduct. Over the last five months, challenging the, the way we have trapped human beings in cages where they can't socially distance while a virus is raging through our society that can only be stopped by social distancing, as we all know. Um, all of that work, we ask ourselves the question, are we just trying to win a legal case or are we, do we have a theory for, for how bringing this case, participating this, in this case, working with organizers on the ground who are working on this issue, working with journalists and artists and others around this issue, do we have a theory for how this case fits into changing the popular narrative around um, human caging, around the use of the criminal punishment bureaucracy, and building power in specific communities um, around specific campaigns to dismantle that system. And if we can't answer that question, if we don't have a theory for how the case is going to do that, the case probably won't, even if we technically win it in court, it probably won't do much good. And I'll just leave, just close out with one example. 
there was a movement um, 50 years ago led by very fancy lawyers, most of them white male lawyers from elite institutions that said, you know what? The cash bail system in this country is unfair to the poor. It's racially discriminatory. It's unjust, it has to go. And it culminated um, in the passage of a landmark federal law, um, the Bail Reform Act of 1984. And, but because this reform was led by the people in the system who had created the cash bail problem, lawyers and judges mainly, the reform um, eliminated wealth-based detention but dramatically expanded the ability of judges and prosecutors to, to detain people without cash. At, on the day they passed that law in 1984, it was a serious problem. There about 24% of all federal prisoners were detained because they were poor, they couldn't pay cash bail. Today, as I'm talking to you 36 years later after the passage of that law, the pretrial detention rate in, in federal court is 72.4%. The people arrested for federal crimes are more disproportionately poor and more disproportionately black and brown. So we fixed the problem of wealth-based detention, but we tripled pre-child detention of even more disproportionately black and brown people. And that's the kind of solution that will happen if we don't build movement lawyers, if we don't develop a real understanding of what are the systemic forces that create these laws uh, and these social problems and band together in a way that builds power among the people who are most directly impacted by these laws to dismantle them. I'll just stop there, see if any of you all have reactions to, to that or to anything that the rest of you said. I just, I have a quick reaction, which is I, I agree with you. And I think this is one of the reasons why, you know, this movement in some ways has to be led by formerly incarcerated people. So my friend Glenn Martin likes to say those closest to the problem are closest to the solution. And to the extent it's just lawyers driving it and not people who have been directly impacted by the system and who understand the pitfalls of how some of these reforms will play out in the real world, it, it, it's going to be hard for us to get structural change without that. I would echo that, Sean. I think, um, you know, I, as someone who's a family member of somebody that was incarcerated, you know, when you mention Alec, like, having a structural account. I think that's so important because there are things that could have happened to you um, in, in my own experience, having a brother that did not have accommodations for his disability in high school, got into disciplinary trouble or had a lot of disciplinary problems and gets involved with um, a group of individuals that took advantage of him and is tracked right into the prison system, in particular, California Pelicans State Prison, one of the most notorious and harshest prisons. I don't have an account for why that's happening in real time. You develop the structural analysis that you need and that you mentioned, Alec, um, through reading, through community with other uh, people that have experienced that. And that now informs how you look at the problem. And now you're uh, in the position, um, and this is something that I actively work towards. I see a lot of questions about resources. Being in community, and, and to Sean's point, being in community with people directly experiencing these forms of state violence, uh, can supplement uh, the reading that you have to do as a law student or as really a student in any of these academic disciplines because knowledge uh, as a hegemonic force exists in the various disciplines in terms of what is considered knowledge, what is considered to Omnis' earlier point, common sense. How do we build a new common sense, resist these forms of knowledge that tell us what matters, what's relevant, what the curriculum should focus on, et cetera. A lot of that comes from reading, <laughs> you know, a lot of that comes from, again, community and conversation. And so I think you're absolutely right with respect to the structural account and with respect to um, the, the necessity of, of movement lawyers, those of us that, that uh, aspire to be movement lawyers, whether you're currently in law school or in practice, uh, connecting with those on the ground organizing right now because it's happening and there's people that are trying to figure this out collectively. And, and I think in many ways, this points to sort of Amna, your, your recent work in thinking about abolitionist horizons and the experimentation that's happening, um, because it's sort of a collective building that's going on to try to understand what our futures look like, a future that doesn't rely on carceral logics and the carceral state to respond to social problems or, or police or surveillance of, of, of Black communities and communities of color broadly. Um, I have a hard time when I'm on these panels and not looking at the Q&A. So I've been looking at the questions. So I'm going to kind of like pivot in that direction. Um, 
I see there's a bunch of questions about, well, you know, like either for us or in general, just thinking about students, like how do you develop this analysis? What do you do? Um, and I just wanted to kind of think about that. I'm curious what the other panelists think as well. I mean, I want, so Alec is absolutely right that at law schools typically fail at teaching students systemic theory um, or like kind of any kind of historical structural account of why things are the way that they are. I will say if you're in law school in the United States, because I see we have people from all over the world, which is cool. Um, that you know clinics in particular tend to be your best bet at getting some account of something a little bit more structural um but most of the kind of doctrinal classes you're uh, um you're not going to get that um one thing because of the way that things shift when you're living through movement moments that's happening in law schools around the United States is that students are organizing their own study groups, right? And this has happened for many decades, probably since the beginning of law schools, but it's happening with a kind of intensity that I personally have not seen since, uh, you know, in my career. Um, and so for those of you who are in those study groups are looking to figure out how to develop um, community or knowledge of the sort that you need to participate in transformative struggle, I think study groups are really, really important and you can, um, uh, join a pre-existing one or make one up um, with other law students or by, and this is like the other advice I give to everyone who kind of thinks about or is curious about social movements, um, how do you get involved? You have to start going to meetings. That's like <laughs> go to protests and go to meetings. And so you could develop or start a study group at your law school, but you can also develop or start or join a study group at your local movement-based organization. And right now for young people in particular who are on social media, Instagram and Twitter are amazing places to find out what's happening locally, um, what kind of political work, you know, what, what are that, what's the local campaign to defund the police or the abolitionist organization or the base building union or whatever it is. Um, and so going to meetings is really, and protest is really important. Um, I, I sometimes feel because, in some ways, my biggest pleasure in life, what I love the most is a really good conversation, is that the reason why I've always loved protest is because it feels sometimes as if it's like the only place in the United States where you cannot be in your family or in your among your friends and step into a space where people are talking about things in a real and honest and true way. So go to, you know, when people are taking to the streets, go, go see, go listen, go learn, figure out who to connect with, who to think differently with, um, who to struggle with. And, and recognize that most of what you hear about the legal profession and lawyers in particular in law school is just wrong. Um, somehow we, we have convinced law school students that the second they get a law license, they have character, they have perseverance, they are omnipotent. Um, but I tell you that I spent 11 years in federal prison. There are many of the men I served time with, I would invite over to my house right now to watch my kids but there are many lawyers I would never give my home address to. Um, I think you have to understand that, that the profession, how you hear and how the profession is talked about in law school is very much not how the profession applies in the real world. Um, and I think that's one of the great things about Alex's book. I feel as a lawyer complicit in mass incarceration and I tend to call lawyers out on it. Um, and lawyers do not like to hear that. I don't think lawyers would, and a lot of lawyers would not enjoy reading Alec's book um, because Alec just calls it out for what it is and, and calls lawyers to action. And I think a lot of lawyers have just, they know that mass incarceration is a problem, but it's somebody else's problem. Uh, and as long as I can hide behind the rule of law, as long as I can hide behind, well, you know, I just represent the government, the government's my client. Um, they don't feel complicit in the system in the way that they should. Yeah, just to add um, on, on what you all are saying and, and looking at some of these questions, there's so many great questions, we're not going to have time to answer them all. But um, there's a real desire in the questions to, to figure out what you can do and what you can read. And so I'll just say, um, in terms of, of what you can read, I, I in particular tried to uh, in the footnotes in the book to cite the things that I thought were useful sources. I just pasted in the chat column another article that I published a couple of weeks ago, and all of the links in that article are deliberately chosen to be things that I think you should read um, or that, that are helpful to read. Um, but much more importantly, there's a really wonderful online resource that I think is an incredible place to start 
if you're starting a study group, if you have a study group, um, it's called transformharm.org. Um, and transformharm.org is an abolitionist resource curated by Miriam Kaba um, that puts together uh, videos, podcasts, uh, online articles, books uh, around all of these issues um, that, that is just one of the best places to start. And it's, if you just poke around on there, you can find things that um, will, will lead you in all kinds of other directions. And I think as Amna said, you should do this with other people. You should go on that journey with other people because everything works better when you're in solidarity with other people, when you're learning together and pushing each other. Um, in terms of what you can do, I, I wanna also highlight something Amna said, and, and I, I think these issues are better tackled in whatever community you are a part of, uh, locally, um, in various um, uh, communities, whatever identity is shared in, in those communities, even if it's just geographic. Um, th there are all over the country, there are local community organizations that are organizing around um, divesting resources from the police and investing those resources in black communities. And um, so for example, a, a lot of places there are new court watch programs that are organizing people to watch court proceedings together. Even by Zoom, you can just sign up. Uh, my mother who was watching this event just retired a month ago and is already part of the local Pittsburgh court watch program. Um, observing what's going on in court, making reports about what prosecutors and judges and defense lawyers are doing and meeting a bunch of other people and starting to talk together about what the system is doing. And, and when you combine that with the kind of um, political education that you can get by reading some of these sources, you start to have real development of solidarity among, among people. Um, and so there's other things other than court watching. There's mutual aid programs in all major towns and cities now that are working to uh, do a variety of things, come together to support people who are being targeted by ICE, who are being targeted by the local police, to support people that are getting out of prison, to support people um, who are survivors of, of abuse in non-carceral alternatives to, to treating that abuse. There are, there are ways of getting involved, um, no matter how, whether it's, there's other programs in, in, in cities all over the country, for example, that are helping people who are coming out of prison start their own worker-owned co-ops. Um, there's other programs that are working on local environmental issues um, and organizing people around them um, in a way that, that tackles the connection between environmental issues and criminal legal system issues. So I can't do those things justice right now, but I do think that you should take a little time and look at what's going on in your community. Who are the people that have a radical analysis of our society needing to change dramatically? Who's working to defund and divest from the police in your community and try to get involved there? I'll give you one more idea. Um, people ask me all the time, how do we get involved in criminal justice reform? And they think, oh, I wanna pass a bill or I wanna get some policy change or give money to some organization. Here, here's another way that I think you can both learn about the system and help individuals at the same time. Go teach a class in prison. Uh, you will undoubtedly impact the people in prison with your wisdom and knowledge, but I'll tell you one thing else, they will have a profound impact on you. I've never met a single person who hasn't gone into a prison and taught a class that didn't come out um, with a great appreciation for the humanity that's in those prisons and the amount of talented people that, you know, um, the rest of society thinks of as bad people, but that once these people, you get to know them, you just realize they're not bad people, they just made bad decisions. Amna, Mila, do you have anything more you want to say in response to the question? There's a question that stands out really just to, oh, sorry, Amna, do you, um, I was just going to acknowledge sort of the two questions that I see talking about how to like manage as a law student, you know, the, you know, challenge of sitting in a classroom and, um, you know, wanting to resist, wanting to speak up. And so again, I would really encourage people to look at and think about critical theory, you know, in particular as a site for uh, developing a style of argumentation to resist the dominant ways of thinking about the law, to resist the uh, dominant norms uh, around objectivity and neutrality that might um, feel stifling when you're trying to critique doctrine that's harmful and you know it's harmful 
where you want to speak up and your professor perhaps doesn't feel like the type of argument that you're presenting is appropriate or suitable for class discussion. Um, so um, I also wanted to just quickly note for those that are yeah concerned about the heavy debt, that's a structural issue. You know, we uh, create situation a system where it's very expensive to go to law school, of course, the incentives are now structured against you to go into public interest work broadly or radical movement lawyering uh, more specifically. So I, I, I just would encourage that person because I'm seeing the question and I know I struggled with that just to reach out to me. I think for me, I had the privilege of going to a law school that funded a fellowship so that I could do that. I'm a first generation law student. It would not have been possible to go into some of this work without that additional funding. So, um, you know, look for fellowships as a way in, but I, I do acknowledge that this is a structural problem. And so we should at least acknowledge the privilege there and even being able to pursue some of these career objectives. I was just going to add one thing. Um, so Alec had said a little while ago that law school doesn't teach us to organize together. Um, and just to say, yes, of course he's right. But also just to notice that the reason why it doesn't, right, is because, um, you know, the, the idea that the individual is the most salient and important kind of, um, uh, kind of political actor. So not collectives, but individuals, like how they, you know, that is kind of central to our legal system and the prevailing kind of political ideology. And so collective action, is something, any form of collective action um, outside of maybe the standard heteronormative family uh, is, um, a, you know, poses a kind of, or has a potential to pose challenge to the prevailing system. And a big part of what the legal system does in fact is to make large scale distributional conflict, uh, you know, discrete and seem individual as if it's between the plaintiff and the defendant. Um, and, um, and so, and, and it depoliticizes it in that way. And so one of the really important reasons why if you believe in um, social justice, um, it's really important to have a, understand how the law works as a law student, as a lawyer, but also have a critical eye towards it is to constantly be involved in thinking about what work the law is doing to kind of depoliticize what is ultimately political, economic, and social conflict, and then how to come together with other people to try to move in different ways so that it doesn't just become fe all feeling and seeming like technical policy, technocratic dispute. We, we have um, one more minute left. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. And I hope this very brief discussion is just the beginning of, of exploration for, for, for a lot of the people on the, who've been typing these amazing questions. And, and I, I personally think that like, if everyone who was listening, you know, came together with five or 10 other people, friends, and just started exploring this stuff together, both because it can be daunting to do it on your own, but but reading some of these resources that have been posted in here, and I see another a Dean Spade um, article that's been posted, which is also amazing, uh, and the Bill Quigley uh, letter uh, that Amna posted. All of this is really amazing stuff. And then you guys together, as you're learning, you can also start doing and getting involved in your in your local community in in ways that that can really help. And so I hope this is just the, the very beginning of, of that for, for many of you. And, and I try to think of, of each day, like how I can start something else myself, um, a new practice of being in solidarity with someone new um, and really expanding the, the people that are in my circle um, and who I can learn from and, and be in struggle with. So um, if, if, and if you all have any final remarks, um, please uh, offer them now. And if not, we will, um, we will, we will close it out and, and um, again, oh, one more thing that I, I need to mention before we stop. Um, if you purchase the book, Usual Cruelty, um, all of the royalties go to an amazing organization called the SE Justice Group. That's E-S-S-I-E. -S -S I'll just type it into the, the chat box now. Um, it's an organization that um, organizes women who have incarcerated loved ones. And so none of the royalties are going to support me. Um, they're all going to SE Justice Group. And so I think it's a wonderful cause um, uh, to, to support. And you should check out their website, which Jay just posted uh, in, the, in the chat thread and, and take a look at their work. 
Um, and, and if you're in California, there may be ways, and you have loved ones in, in prison, there may be ways of getting involved with their work directly right now. Um, that's the last thing I wanted to say about the book. That, does anyone else have anything they want to add? Um, there's a question in there about reaching out to the panelists. Um, uh, I don't know how um, you all feel about that. You all on, they're all on Twitter and social media. Um, and we can we can type our, our Twitter handles into the chat. And is that the best way? I don't know. Most people who teach at universities, so me, Sean, and Jamelia, you just Google, you find our email addresses at our law school website. So it's pretty, we're all pretty easily contactable. Alec might not have a public email, I don't know, but we all do. And if you can't remember how to spell my name, just Google bank robber and law professor. There's only one of us. <laughs> Thank you all uh, very much um, for the discussion and, and for your time. I appreciate it very much.